Uh, before the kids uh, run out, um, I want to tell you something. I want to read a few things to you. Um, this morning, uh, let me read to you Hebrews 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. I think we might have it on the screen here. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Now, the writer of Hebrews in, in, in chapter 12, he starts by saying this, he says, therefore. And when he says, therefore, what that means is he must have just said something that was important. I said this, therefore, now I'm gonna say this. So what he just said in chapter 11 has to be important. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, the chapter before 12 is, you guys, seriously, like, you can't count to 12? All right. The chapter before 12 is 11, all right? Chapter 11, Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter in the Bible. It's also kind of like a who's who when it comes to faith in the Bible. And you can't understand what he's talking about in chapter 12 until you look back at chapter 11. That's why he begins by saying, therefore. What he's saying here is kind of like this. And because of everything that I just said in 11, now here's the point of what I just said in 11. So before we get to the point here in just a minute of 12, I want to make a petition to the kids, a challenge, all right? Where, do I have more than two kids? Where's all the kids? Okay, so, oh yeah, they're everywhere. Okay, so here's the deal, kids. If you can come up here to me in the next few weeks and you can memorize all of Hebrews 11, I will give you $20. Yes. And I know it can be done because when I was in the second grade, my teacher gave me a dollar. Inflation and all, you guys, you know, it's been a lot from there. Um, if the first person to uh, memorize all of chapter 11, well, we got a dollar in my class. So $20 to any kid who can memorize all of chapter 11. So while you're thinking about how hard this would be and when you're working on it, think about the prize. The prize in front of you is $20. That's right. So when you're like tired, you're like, man, I got to get to 20. I got to go. So that's it. All right. Anybody, you guys want to accept the challenge? You're going to try it? All right. Caspian. Hey, superhero Caspian. All right. All right. Here's the deal. Thank you, Gary. All right, here's the deal. I'm also gonna put this challenge out for the adults. If the adults, if you can memorize chapter 11 and you get the money if you come up here on the stage and you have to, and you have to um, say it with the microphone in front of everybody, in front of the stage, but if the adults can do it, I'm gonna let you pay the kid who did it $20. <laughs> totally kidding. Same thing, 20 bucks. Anybody that can record uh, Hebrews 11. All right, you guys are dismissed. You can take off, kids. That's cool. All right, just remember what I said. Keep the prize in front of you. Now, what I thought about doing this morning, before we jump back and look at Hebrews 11 as they're leaving, um, I thought about paraphrasing Hebrews 11 this morning and explaining to you guys, here's kind of what Hebrews 11 says and all that stuff. Well, instead of paraphrasing it, I just decided, you know what? The Bible speaks for itself. We don't only do this. Let's read the whole chapter together, all of Hebrews 11. Um, I think it's important because it's one of the most powerful chapters in all of, of the Bible. And it's one of the most encouraging chapters to me when I'm going through suffering. When I'm going through a hard time in my life, it just has this incredible hope wrapped up in it. And it's a list of people who had the faith that I really desire to have. Hebrews 11 is a list of people who did it right. And I want to be like them. Well, I want you to remember this as we're listening to these people, that each one of them had problems. Each one of these people had problems. They had sin in their life, just like you and me. Every one of them made mistakes. But because of this great and amazing faith that they had in the Lord, they made it through. And God's grace was on them. And that's what I need. I need more of God's grace. You need more of God's grace. We all need God's grace. And so what I'm going to try to do is read through Hebrews 11 here without crying. <laughs> it's hard for me to read Hebrews 11 without tears because I want you to remember, like I said, this is real people. This happened. This is not a fairy tale. It's not something that was made up somewhere. They are not also uh, superhumans or super Christians or anything like that. It's attainable what they did. They're just like 
me and you, but they had this belief and this faith that their God is a God who keeps his promises. And they believed that he would go with them and that he puts this prize in front of them. And if they would finish the race, that they would get the prize that God had put in front of them. Well, what is the prize? We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Before we do that, and he mentions it several times here in Hebrews, but he talks about it in 12. Let's just read this together. I'll read it. And I want you to look at what they endured to get the prize. Hebrews 11, starting with verse one. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel, he offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before uh, he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Wouldn't it be great if it said that about us? And without faith, it's impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he, com uh, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him in the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has, has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. And they all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of a land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, listen to this, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was e able to even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones. By faith, Moses... When he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do so, the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? 
For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, endured justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by the resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains and in caves and on earth and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should be made perfect." If you haven't read Hebrews 11 in a while, you need to go back and read it some more this week. It's powerful, isn't it? You can almost sense the energy as he's writing it. He's getting more and more names and he's getting really excited about it. And he's like, I've got so many people I can't even mention. Listen to the faithfulness of these people who valued their God more than anything else in the world, including their lives. And my favorite verse in Hebrews 11 One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is when he says this, of whom the world was not worthy. He talks about all these people in whom the world was not worthy. And see, I think that's one of the things that's so confusing for us as human beings. It's one of the things that I think we fail at most. It's value, what we value. He says the world is not as valuable as these people. The world itself didn't understand what true value is. And they were so prized and they were so valued by God that the entire world is beneath these people of faith is what he's saying. So let me ask you this question. What or where do you put value? Where do you put value in your life? What's important to you? And it's really where most of our problems come from if you think about it. In your mind right now, you're going through whatever issues you're going through, whatever suffering, whatever thing you can't understand, whatever mystery it's going on, it's where you put value. And certain people put value in this and other people put value in that. We don't value the same things. You think about your house. People are really upset. I don't know how I'm gonna make my house payment. We've got this beautiful house and the job is not going great, blah, blah, blah. I don't know how I'm gonna make the house. I know people who don't have houses. I know that there are a whole bunch of people just right over here that are living in tents. Rained all night last night. Most of you guys had a house. There's people in this neighborhood that I know that did not have a place last night to stay, living in tents. You say, well, I can't fix my car. I don't have enough money to get my car going and I got a flat tie. I just can't believe this. You'll never guess what in my car. I'm so poor. You know how many people don't have cars in this neighborhood? They can't get to work. There's so many, there's so many people in this neighborhood who would love to have a car. You say, well, I can't afford to eat at this place or that place. Every single week, someone comes by and says, can I have some food? And I take them right over here to our food pantry and we're feeding people out of this church every single week. What do you value? What do you value? The world's value system, let me tell you, is not the kingdom value system. It's not that at all. Some of us hate our jobs. Some of you guys are like, man, I can't stand my job. It's terrible. And you're miserable going to work each day. And there's so many people that can't find a job just right here in our neighborhood and in the world, and they'd love to be miserable in your job. (laughs) They'd love to have a job. And there's something in their past that keeps some employer from giving them a chance or giving them a job, and they would take your miserable job in a heartbeat. What do you value? And if you want to test me on this theory, quit your job tomorrow and see how fast they replace you. (laughs) Someone else will take that miserable job. What do you value? We're blessed people. I also, I love those weight loss commercials, you know? Like when people, uh, they wanna show you how uh, if you you do this, you can look better, you know? And um, and then they show the the fat version of the person at first and their shoulders are down and their hair is disheveled and they're not smiling and the next picture, their shoulders are back and they're smiling and their hair's fixed, you know? It's always funny to me. Because I always think, man, if I do that, I can lose weight and my hair will look better, you know, I guess. But we value things that other people don't value and the world is trying to tell us what to value and they're putting a spin on it saying, if you do this, you'll be more content, you'll be more happy. If you'll value this, that's where your contentment will come from. If you lose this, you're gonna be in trouble and then we buy into that. We buy into the world's value system, not in kingdom values. And what happens in Hebrews 11 is he said, look at what God values. This is God's values not what the world values. And these two systems are totally 
opposite of one another. They're 180 degrees difference of, of each other. The world system is this. We value ourselves above everything else. That's everything that I described to you, mostly. The world system is value yourself above everything else and the kingdom value is value God above everything else. That's the kingdom values. And it's a testimony here of his people valuing what he values. That's what Hebrews 11 is about. It's a testimony to them because they value him. What does God value most? He values him. They value his name and his renown and his glory and they value it so much above everything else, including their life, that they're willing to give their own lives in gruesome and terrible ways because they see the prize and the reward as God himself. And they're waiting on that. And the reason that they'll go through that is because he has made a promise and he's promised them something and they know and we know that that promise is bigger than anything this world can offer to us. It's beyond imagine. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that the world has no idea. They have no idea what real value and real treasure is. The world is completely oblivious to what actually real treasure is. Hebrews 11, these people understand it. What we see as great rewards are nothing compared to what God is offering us. And I love what C.S. Lewis says. I want to read this to you because he describes how we value things. And C.S. Lewis said, it's not that we, our desires are too strong. He's saying it's, they're too weak. It's not that you're valuing something too much. You're not valuing it enough. Listen to what he says. C.S. Lewis, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he can't not imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. That's a value statement. And he's saying, look at what the world is valuing. Here it is in the bottle. It doesn't even compare to what God is offering us, what the reward is. And you're making mud pies in the slum because you have no idea what it means to value God this way because you have no idea how much he values you. So what do you value? What are you chasing? What is your heart's desire? What is the thing right now you're running strong after? What are you looking for? And, and um, how's that going for you? <laughs> are you content with whatever it is you value right now? You lot of, a lot of contentment in your life right now because those things are rewarding for you? Are those things that you value, are they paying off? What reward are you getting from what you value? What's the payoff? What are you investing right now your life mostly in? What's getting you through? And the reason that these questions are important is because once you figure out what the reward is, then you know what you're willing to go through to get it. Let me explain it this way. Well, first of all, let me say this. Number one, where do you put value? Number two, what are you willing to endure to get it? Whatever it is that you value. Let me tell you, let me explain it with a story. Some of you heard this story before, but when I was a kid, I was 12 years old and I wanted a boat. Sounds a little weird, like a 12 year old wants a boat, but I had big ambitions. I didn't want a big boat, I just wanted a boat. And uh, so my dad, he answered my petition for this and he came one, home one day with a boat for me in the back of his truck. <laughs> Tells you how big it was. Just slid it right up in the back of the truck and brought it home. And I was so excited. Um, He was nice enough to give it to me, but he said, but you're gonna have to get a motor and we're gonna have to build a trailer for it. It was a little tiny John boat. He bought it from a neighbor up the street. So my eyes were set on me. Like when I saw that boat and I had this thought, I could see me and my buddies riding riding down the lake with my new motor, it's gonna be a little motor like this right here. And my John boat waving at the girls. Uh huh. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I wanted. But the only way to get there was to get a job. And 12 year olds don't like jobs. I'm just telling you, they don't. So the only one that I could really get was cutting grass. And so I asked around some of the neighbors and I got a couple of yards lined up. So there's that boat sitting in the yard with no motor on it, you know, and I'm cutting grass looking going, all right, that's where I'm headed. That's the reward I want. But then my dad threw another wrench in the system. 
uh, when he said, well, you can't use my lawnmower to go cut grass. You got to get your own. It's like, he's like, but I got this old broke down lawnmower that didn't have a motor. So he gave me that and said, you need to buy a motor for that and I'll let you borrow the money. And then when you cut enough yards, you know, you pay me back for that and then you can start saving for the boat motor. And uh, I figured out real quickly that what he had offered me with that lawnmower was a boat anchor (laughs) that needed a motor. So um, I started cutting yards, trying to pay him back and uh, trying to pay off the motor. Well, you see where all this is going, right? I'm I'm cutting grass and trying to pay off this motor so I can get that motor. And um, 12 year olds have no aspirations for owning lawnmowers. Let me just tell you, that's not part of it. Um, So um, I cut enough yards to pay for the lawnmower so I could start paying for the boat. Um, But that was just part of the journey in order for me to get this reward that I had put in front of myself, which is a motor for my little boat. And what I was willing to give up for it was every Saturday, not playing with my friends, going and cutting grass. If it meant me getting enough money to buy this motor, I had my eyes set on the prize, which is this boat motor. And eventually I was able to, to buy the motor, but I think I immediately said, man, I got the motor, I'm done with grass cutting, you know, and I quit all that and then realized, oh man, the motor needs gas. And so then I had to go back cutting grass again to save up for gas for my, for my boat motor. And then here I am all these years later, I'm still working and still cutting grass. So I don't know how this has much changed, but life is that way, isn't it? And the problem with us in our adversity and with our blues and our suffering is that we've lost sight of the prize. We don't know what we're going. We don't know where we're looking for. We're confused on why these things are happening because we don't see the prize in front of us. And Hebrews 11 is a testimony to those people who lived their whole life never losing sight of the prize. It was always in front of them. Look what it says about Moses, Hebrews eleven twenty six. 26. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. C.S. Lewis says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward, I love how he describes that, and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel. Isn't that an amazing way to describe this? If we would just consider it, so what is the reward? Hebrews 11.10, for he was looking forward to the city that that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. He was looking for a city. Hebrews 11.16, but as it is, they desired a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. Hebrews eleven twenty six. he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt where he was looking to the reward. You see what it's showing you? They're all looking for the reward. They're looking for the city. They're looking for what God has promised them. And we can grab a few clues in here to what the reward is. Greater worth than all the world's wealth. Uh, God says he's preparing the city for us. They're looking for a country that's better than this one. Can anyone relate to that? You're looking for a country that's better than this one? I think we've got some problems. Do you want a city that's just made just for you? That's what he's describing here. Do you want a greater reward than all of the riches of the world? That's what he's talking about in Hebrews 11. Look what Jesus says in John 14 about this. Let not your hearts be troubled. I love that he says that first because he understands where we are. He begins with that. I know you're struggling. I know life is hard. I know you're going through suffering. I know you got some mysterious things. I know you don't understand. You're confused. I know you're bothered by it. Don't let your heart be troubled. He starts with that because God's compassion and grace on us is always there and he understands and he says, believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself and where I am, you may be also. And then we look back now at 12 to see the prize. Listen to what he says, therefore... Hebrews 11, all of this stuff, all because of that, all these people, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is seated at the right hand 
of the throne of God. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go, I will come and take you to be with me. So here's this city being built for us. And there's a house there and there's plenty of room. That's what he's saying. You don't have to stay with somebody else. (laughs) It's not like sharing a hotel room, all right? He said, this place is humongous and there's plenty of room. You get your own room. And this room that you're in, it's like a whole city. Like I can't even describe it to you. It's so big. That's what you get. And over and over, we see these verses in language like this. Let not your hearts be troubled. And he endured the cross for the prize that was set before him. And the prize that Jesus had set before him is this, is his chair seated back at the right hand of God. His prize that he saw before him was that he gets to be back in the presence of almighty God. And he'd been there before and he knows what it's like. And he believed that this prize of being back with the father on the throne, again with him, is so valuable. It's back to this value system. It's so valuable, it's so incredible, it's so joy-giving that I am willing to endure the cross, the most brutal death that a human being can just about go through. I will go to that. I look over here and I see God and I see the cross. I'm going with him and I'll do whatever it takes to get back to that reward, to be back with the Father again. I live for him, I will die for him because I know what it's like to be in the presence of God and that reward is incredible to me, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And the good news, this is great news for us. You know why? Because you have the same prize offered to you. Every one of us in this room, you have the same joy set in front of you that Jesus had when he endured the cross. When we endure the suffering in this world, we get the ultimate prize, which is a seat at the table with God and with Jesus in a city that has a house built just for us and Jesus is there preparing it right now. And the writer of of Hebrews understands the suffering and he understands the hurt, he understands the blues and he says, Jesus did it and so can you. You can make it through it. You gotta keep your eyes on him. He endured it. Lay aside every weight Here's how to do it with joy. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance. We've been talking about endurance for the past few weeks. It's hard to make it through this life. We've got to figure out a way to endure it. Run with endurance the race looking to Jesus. Life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And you've got to keep your head up when you're running marathons. And what are you looking for when you're running You're looking for the finish line. And he says, keep your eyes on Christ. He's gone through the life. He's gone through the pain. He's been through the suffering. He understands. He's in front of you preparing the way. He's running in front of you, getting everything uh, together for you. And he understands. And he was willing to endure the cross for the joy that was set in front of him. And my question for you this morning is, what are you willing to endure? for the reward and for the prize? What do you value? What are you looking to? Where are your eyes? What's getting you through the pain and the suffering? What are you willing to endure? So here's how I wanna end, okay? We're gonna do something a little different this morning. If you're visiting, we don't always do this. So I kind of apologize, but you know, we're also kind of weird around here anyway. Here's what I want us to do. I'm gonna invite uh, a few people that I talked to. Joey, if you can, can you stand right there uh, at the dorm and invite uh, Paul and the band back up here? Uh, Josh, where's Josh at? And um, John is in here somewhere. Uh, Brenda is gonna come up here. Um, I talked to, there he is. He's coming in the back door. Um, who else did I talk to? Was that right? Who else did I talk to? Luciano, where's Luciano? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can, um, John, you can stand right back there at the door if you want to go, since you just came out of it. Luciano, why don't you stand right over here? That's good. All right, so here's what we're going to do, all right? And I want you to take this, this moment seriously because there there's a, there's, can be a huge blessing here. What he describes, he says, lay aside the sin. And he's describing here is there's some stuff that entangles us. There's some stuff that's weighting us down, and it's hard to run this life um, 
carrying all of this baggage. So I want to give us an opportunity this morning and kind of make it easy. You don't have to come down here. You can, you can go back here to one of these guys. But we just want to pray this morning for you if you want. And just lay that burden right down. So what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. And then I'm going to uh, describe something for you with your eyes closed. I want you to imagine something. And then I want to pray for us. And then, uh, and then Paul will transition us to our next song and, and, and end the service here in just a second. But I want you to imagine this. He describes, he see, it's so we're, we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. I want you to imagine that you're on the, the track and you're running a marathon, okay? You're running around the track. And in the stands are all the people that he just described in Hebrews 11. Noah is there, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Enoch, Jesus is there. You think about the loved ones that you have who've already passed on, who have died, who had faith in Jesus, and they're in the stands. It's 100 degrees outside, it's hot, and everybody's cheering you on. But they're yelling something at you because you're trying to run around the track in a winter coat. And you've got this big coat on. And they're yelling, just take the coat off. Just take the coat off. We got a lot of stuff in our life that's holding us down, that's keeping us from running the race with endurance. And what I'd like to do today is give you a chance to come pray with somebody and just lay that down. Just take the winter coat off. Just lay the sin down. Lay whatever it is. Come and pray with one of these guys or Brenda or me. I'm going to walk down here in just a second. Don't, don't let this moment go by. Just take somebody here by the hand and just let us pray for you. We need one another. and We need to lay these burdens down at the feet of Jesus so we can run with endurance the race that is set before us. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. I pray for hearts. I pray this morning, God, that right now that we would take off the coat, that we would lay the sin down at your feet this morning. Unashamed, God, just say, please take this from me, God. I don't need it anymore. I need to, I need to get this off of me. I need to change my value system. I need to keep my eyes on the prize. I've lost sight of you. I need to get it back. Whatever that is, God, this morning, I pray we would lay those burdens and those things down, God. We could walk out free this morning and able to run the race with endurance, God. Give us the energy. Give us the endurance. Give us the strength only by your name, God. We praise you this morning. We worship you for being a God who cares, who's compassionate, who gives us grace continually over and over and over. God, we worship you this morning, God, but we ask you, God, right now to do something powerful in our lives in these next few minutes. We love you in Jesus' name.